We begin tonight with a live look at a tense situation outside the Brooklyn Center Police Department where a fourth night of protests are underway. The 10 p.m. curfew is just now going into effect and you can see there are a lot of people still there. We have heard law enforcement giving warnings for at least the last half hour about the crowd dispersing. They are warning that arrests will be made. It has been tense for the last few hours. There have been objects thrown at police and we've seen chemical irritants and flashbangs thrown into the crowd of protesters. And in the last hour, the National Guard brought in more troops. We are getting a closer look also via social media tonight, as you can see some of the uh, photos that we're showing on our screen right now, uh, just to give us a little bit better view of what is happening uh, in front of the police station, which is located on Humboldt Avenue in Brooklyn Center. And uh, obviously there was a, a, a good sized crowd there tonight. Reports earlier said that this crowd a little bit smaller than what we've seen the last couple of nights, but described as just as determined as crowds have been the last couple of nights too. And so that, that's an idea of what we're seeing out there uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the evening here. And those who came to the protest tonight, many did bring umbrellas. We're hearing reports also of leaf blowers. They're using those things to avoid being hit by the rubber bullets and they're using the leaf blowers to blow those chemical irritants back toward law enforcement. So this crowd came and it appears many of them have no intention of leaving. As we mentioned, they have asked them to disperse several times, but the curfew just now officially went into effect. And I think it's fair to say the crowd has steadily grown throughout the night as well. This started uh, as a rally at about five o'clock this evening calling for justice for Dante Wright. We have crews on the ground around the perimeter of the protest, but we want to start tonight with Max Nestrick. He's with the Minnesota Reformer, and he has been out among the protesters there tonight. Max, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Thank you for having me on. Well, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing right now and maybe compare it to what you've witnessed maybe over the last hour or so. Right. So what I'm seeing right now is uh, several hundred people crowded right at the front of uh, the fence that's been set up outside the Brooklyn Center Police Station. And right at the fence, you see a line of police officers pointing flashlights and uh, weapons at protesters. Protesters have brought, like you said, umbrellas and leaf blowers to try and deflect objects. There's been um, some skirmishes that we've seen over the past hour that we've uh, and we've heard that, you know, they've given the dispersal order, they've declared this an unlawful assembly, but people are determined to stay and are not leaving. Well, Max, we know the National Guard was uh, at a staging center down in Golden Valley at Duluth and, and Highway 100. They began moving towards this area a little after 9 o'clock. Can you tell us a little bit about what you see uh, on that end of Humboldt Avenue, as they have now staged themselves, uh, are, are they apparent? Do you see them? What, what do you see when it comes to that? Right. So at the end of Humboldt, on one end of Humboldt, you can see flashing lights and you see a lot of uh, trucks in that direction. Um, in the other direction, it seems to be clear that people could still leave if they chose to. Um, they've been there with the we've seen the flashing lights for at least an hour. Um, and but they haven't they haven't moved in they haven't started making arrests yet that i've seen um what i have seen is a number of people being hit with rubber bullets and and fire fireworks being launched over the fence at police and how would you describe the feeling there tonight obviously it's very tense right now we're seeing some really stark images on the screen but it, it seemed to me that it, it, it got tense quicker and things seemed like they were ramped up even from last night. Is, is that a, an accurate assessment? Right. That, that's correct, right? Um, even around uh, 7, 30, 8 o'clock, there were, uh, I heard, you know, cracks of, of rubber bullets being fired. But there's really kind of two different energies happening. Right at the fence, it's very tense. People are with gas masks, goggles, helmets umbrellas um, ready to be fired upon. But you go just uh, maybe 100 feet back and just on the corner, people are hanging out. People are not wearing uh, masks. They're just drinking. Um, in some cases, one person had a, a little fire pit going. Feels more of uh, like people are hanging out and just watching what's happening, just uh, not, not so many feet away from them. 
Well, we appreciate your insight tonight. We'd love for you to hang around and we'll check back in a little while. Thank you so much, Max. You're welcome. Heidi Wigdahl is uh, one of our reporters. She's been out there all night and she is uh, not that far from uh, the police station. Heidi, if you can hear me, tell us what you see there tonight. Max described some of the things we're seeing out here, but you can see there's still quite a large crowd out here. We've seen some objects be thrown across the fence. There's one that goes right now, and police have been responding with pepper spray projectiles. And for a while, it actually was a lot calmer out here, but just within the past 10 minutes or so, we started to see more activity. The dispersal orders, when those started off, we actually, we were editing a story. So there's some of the things that we've been talking about. We're gonna step a little back here. Um, when we were, oh, we're hearing another dispersal order. Hard for us to hear. You'll have to kind of tell us what you're hearing. Yep. Yeah, Randy, so I don't know if you could hear that right now, but they just gave another dispersal order and protesters are responding by booing back at them we're seeing more objects being thrown over the fence you know the dispersal order we were walking to the scene around 9 30 and we did see quite a few people choosing to leave at this time but you can see the amount of people who are choosing to stay out here right now and like max had mentioned a lot of people have umbrellas and helmets and things to kind of um, shield themselves from these projectiles that are being projected back at them well, Heidi, uh, yeah, we know that's pretty much the scene right now. Is there? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Heidi. Go ahead, Julie. Well, I'm just wondering. Uh, you know, no, last go ahead. last night it was a similar scene, and uh, at some point in time, law enforcement, we assume, will decide they are ready to move and disperse this crowd. We know there were uh, almost 80 arrests last night. Have you seen any arrests happening yet or is everyone just on kind of their side of the line so far? You know, Julie, I have, I have not seen that so far. Um, at this point, it's pretty much, as you can see, the law enforcement on the one side of the fence, the protesters on the other. We haven't seen them trying to get into position like Monday night. We saw them sort of move into position and corner off both sides on the north and south side, and it split up the crowd into two sections, and we haven't seen any of that tonight so far. From your vantage point, Heidi, can you see uh, any of the National Guard that was uh, assembled uh, down at the end of Humboldt Avenue? Can you see any of that at this point? From my vantage point, I cannot. Devin, can you? No, we can't from our vantage point. Um, just to give you an idea of where we are, we are on the north side directly in front of the police department. We are seeing more people starting to leave the area now. All right, Heidi, thanks so much. Stay safe, we appreciate it. We're gonna check in now with our Steve Jefferson who has also been out uh, among the protesters tonight. Steve? Yeah, I'm at 69th and Humboldt and a caravan of sheriff's SUVs just arrived to this intersection. As you can see behind me, uh, there's another section coming here. They are actually uh, using their sirens and lights to warn people that the curfew is in effect. And there are people who are trying to get out of this part of the perimeter. So what they did last night, they came here last night, they set up a perimeter to push people back right now that this is the first part of the caravan basically they're using again their lights and sirens to try to get people to go home the curfew is in effect we have already heard from the organizers of operation safety net that they will arrest people uh, for being out after the curfew last night when we were at this intersection we saw uh, deputies we saw troopers and obviously police officers who are part of Operation Safety Net asking people to go home, asking people to respect the curfew as well. Ironically, since we've been standing here, we've seen literally almost 100 people walk towards the police department, but um, they're parking their cars uh, several blocks north of here. Eventually, they will also ask us to leave. Um, and again, this is where a caravan came in heavy last night. Right now, we're just seeing uh, police officers. I'm gonna turn around and give you a look at 
uh, what's happening here at the intersection. George, if you could swing your camera this way. This gas station pump and munch is where a lot of the protesters uh, came up for, you know, to buy drinks and take a rest or take a break. We have some uh, deputies who are getting out of their cars and approaching people. We have uh, a couple of protesters who are on foot trying to get, again, out of this particular perimeter. They, uh, and here comes uh, another part of the caravan that we saw last night. George, I'm gonna ask you to swing this way. This is the same action we had last night where they basically pushed people blocks away from the police department. People who are out will be arrested. As you can see here, we have officers unloading from the vans. Again, they're setting up the perimeter. Steve, if I can, if I can jump in just to kind of give this people- This is happening again right now here at 69th and Humboldt. If I can jump in just to kind of get a little perspective, I know where you're sitting. Uh, down the street on Humboldt is the police station and then beyond that, is where the National Guard was uh, forming. Right now they're ordering people to get out of the car again. This is because they are in violation of the 10 o'clock curfew. As you can see, they are here in full force. Steve, we so appreciate your perspective. The we want to, and if, I'm wondering if our producers, if we could, we know we have uh, former Hennepin County Sheriff Rich Stanick standing by to talk to us, and we'd love to get his perspective on how and why they make the decisions to use force when they do in situations like that. We'll leave this shot up of uh, the law enforcement obviously making the decision that now is the time they're going to forcefully disperse this crowd. They uh, curfew just went into effect 11 minutes ago, but well before that they were telling the crowd that it was an unlawful assembly, presumably because things were being thrown at officers and it was getting very tense at the scene. So they've been telling the crowd to disperse for probably about 45 minutes now. I don't know if we have the former sheriff available, if we can talk to him about decisions that are made by law enforcement in these situations. Because you can see uh, the, the large presence moving in. And of course, all of these officers uh, were going to be on standby for the verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial. They, that is why they created the Operation Safety Net Force and uh, uh, having to deploy it, deploy it rather a lot earlier than anticipated. I understand we do have former Sheriff Rich Stanick on the phone now. Thanks for joining us tonight, Sheriff. Yeah, hi, Julie. You know, I, we have so much I'd love to get your perspective on. One thing I'm hearing over and over again tonight is that the crowd that showed up tonight was angry and determined because of the tactics used last night to disperse the crowd. Can, can you speak to what goes into the decision making of when you're going to deploy tear gas or use rubber bullets and whether or not it's necessary or if there are other options? Well, by the time they get around to making the decision about what level of force they're going to use, it's already a lose-lose situation as your reporter just, you know, just stated, right? I mean, everybody's geared up. You know, one side's not going to leave. The other one has a job to do. And they're going to do it, and they've been very clear. The use, the level of force that they're going to use is going to be reasonable and proportionate based on the response. Once they give that dispersal order, you're going to hear them give it three times, 10 minutes between each one. By the time they get to the third one, though, uh, it's going to start happening. and They'll move forward incrementally, slow, deliberate, methodical response, and keep moving forward. Their goal is not to arrest people, but rather to disperse them. You know, encourage them, inspire them to go home, um, but not everybody will, and you'll end up with a rest tonight again. We saw last night, uh, Rich, that uh, the police lined up on both sides of Humboldt Avenue and kind of kettled those protesters in the middle to make arrests or get them to disperse. Can you talk a little bit about that maneuver and why that's important? Sure. Well, the, the kettle maneuver is pretty common. It's basic uh, mobile field force. 101. There's a lot of different tactics that they will use. You just heard the lights and siren as they were arriving on scene. They want folks to be absolutely aware of what is going to happen. There's no surprises here. I don't think anybody's surprised that 
They're going to start moving forward that they're launching chemical munitions. Um, the whole goal here is to give people an opportunity to disperse. They have an absolute legal right to uh, protest in their First Amendment rights. But once that dispersal order is given, once it's past curfew, no more. And law enforcement has been very clear about this. They got burned pretty bad last summer. You know, people criticize them for not being as forceful as maybe they could have been, resulting in literally 15 plus hundred businesses being burned and looted. We saw the same thing on Sunday night, part of Monday. And I think, you know, this is the way it's going to be for the foreseeable future. I hope that there's calm no moving forward. So I, I want to ask you as well about agitators. The mayor of Brooklyn Center tweeted yesterday that they, they, he believed that outside forces were moving in, whether they're truly from the outside or not, is maybe not even relevant, but that they were coming here intent on causing mayhem. And we've heard a lot of community organizers say too, they want peace. They, the vast majority of protesters there just want their voices heard. And then there are a few who take the situation, which is tense, and there is a lot of emotion, and it's not hard to get people riled up. What do you know about these so-called agitators? How does law enforcement, um, how do they figure out who they are? And do you think that is even the scenario that's playing out? Well, law enforcement has a very good intelligence network, so they know when groups are moving around. Uh, Brooklyn Center is also a very tight-knit community. I mean, it's fairly small. It's a first-wing suburb. They are hurting by what happened on Sunday afternoon. And so a lot of the people out there are local residents that want their voices heard. When you say outside agitators, I think last summer there was a lot of misinformation and bad narrative that these people were somehow coming from somewhere else. I think at the end of the day, that was proven not to be true. The vast majority of the people who were arrested, because that was the best indicator, looking at their home addresses, were that they were from the metropolitan area. They were residents of the state of Minnesota. But do you think that that is true, that there's, there are just a handful of people intent on causing harm and the vast majority are peaceful? Well, that's the age-old axiom, is that 98% of the people who gather for these want to be lawful, peaceful, law-abiding. The other 2% want to mix it up. Those are probably the ones that are closest to the fence. Those are the ones that are getting hit with marking rounds by law enforcement. Those are the ones where the rubber bullets are going to mark them and move them back. Um, and those are the ones that will be arrested at the end of the night. You know, I, I, I wanted to ask you as well about the mayor held a press conference today saying that he had talked with the Hennepin County Sheriff, he's trying to get the message out to the Hennepin County Sheriff, that is the agency that's in charge of this response, as is our understanding, that they didn't want tear gas deployed. Once you hand over control of the operation, uh, as the first part of my question, um, how much do they listen to what he's saying? And, and he appears to feel not at all. And the second part of the question is, are there other options? Is there another way to get this crowd to disperse? Or is law enforcement looking into other ways? Well, the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office is jurisdiction countywide. I'm sure that Operation Safety Net calls for a pact amongst all the agencies in Hennepin County that if one of them needs assistance, assistance, the others will be there to help. The level of force or tear gas being used is dictated, you know, probably on scene, depending on what's, what's happening. So the mayor has his own police department. If he wants to handle the situation in and of itself, he probably should do so, but I don't think they're in a position to be able to do so. So they're asking for assistance. I'm sure his requests are being heard. They're being considered and contemplated, but maybe not uh, maybe not followed exactly the way he wanted. It, like I said, this is from the beginning. This is a lose-lose situation for everybody involved. The cops don't want to be there. They'd rather be at home with their families tonight. Protesters are, and people out there are hurting from what happened on Sunday afternoon and all that's happened in between. And there's got to be calm. Usually we employ and engage uh, community leaders and others that help, uh, you know, resolute between, between the two. And hopefully they will continue to work on this and get it done because it can't go on like this night after night after night. Mr. Stanick, we appreciate your time tonight. Thank you so much. Let's go to uh, Heidi Wigdahl. She's on the scene outside the Brooklyn Center Police Department. Heidi? Yeah, Randy, just within the past five minutes or so, we saw law enforcement in the area 
a state patrol and similar to what we've seen on other nights they pull from the south going headed into north and they're right in front of the gates of the brooklyn center pd at that point as they were starting to move in most of the crowd started to leave the area. but as you can see still quite a few people Okay, we're having some audio issues, unfortunately, with Heidi's report here, but you can see by the pictures that we're showing that she is not far from the front of the police department there in Brooklyn Center. We, we should also point out that all of this in the response to the shooting of Dante Wright and that police officer, former police officer, Kim Potter, was charged today with second degree manslaughter uh, in that case, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that as we move forward. I know we have Steve Jefferson. He's also outside uh, in that area and watching what's happening. Uh, Steve, we know you saw a massive police force come rolling in. What's happening there now? Well, right now they're in the process of letting some people go and others they are arresting. If they were caught inside this perimeter you see behind me where officers are lined up here at 69th Street, if they were inside and even in their cars, I heard one of the officers announce, if you are in your car, get out and get on the ground, you are under arrest. By the same token, I, I actually witnessed where some officers allow people in their car to go drive through the... Um, through the barricade and to actually leave. Since we've been here in the last hour or so, we actually saw people park their cars a couple of blocks north of here and then walk towards the police department even after the curfew started. And there are people still standing around in parking lots here uh, despite the curfew being in place. We have heard loud booms that uh, some of the officers are using to uh, distract some of the protesters. We've also seen some of the protesters um, carrying backpacks and wearing helmets walk down towards the police department despite what you see happening here. The strategy is to take um, the, the to take the neighborhood block by block and to try to force people to um, you know uh, obey the curfew and, and just simply go home. I can tell you that the um, officers here they are prepared for protests each night if necessary. Uh, you kind of sort of thought that if um, once the community learned that Kim Potter, the officer involved in the shooting of Dante Wright was arrested, that maybe that the protests would calm down some, but again, we're having a, another night of unrest. And when I talked to the officers involved in the Operation Safety Net, they made it very clear that they are prepared and they will do what they have to do to make sure that Brooklyn Center remains safe as possible. Back to you in the studio. Well, Steve, I'm just wondering if I could ask you a quick question. We, we heard the perspective from former Sheriff Rich Stanek about the law enforcement and how they're feeling tonight. Have you talked with any of the people that have shown up and just asked them how they're feeling, why they're there, um, and, and if they plan to stay and, and get arrested, if that's the case? Yeah, I, I actually saw a couple of protesters actually inside the perimeter um, acting as if they wanted to be arrested. They didn't leave on command, even though it looks like the, it looked like they were given the opportunity. But I can also tell you too that um, some of the protesters who were not uh, basically inside the perimeter ended up walking in the perimeter even after the officers arrived here asking people and, and, and basically indicating that it was time for them to go home. Um, so it's, it's hard to tell, it depends on you know who the protester is and, and where they're from. I can tell you that there are people from the neighborhood here, there are apartment complexes on almost every block here and there are people who have come out of their homes just to watch the um, show of force here tonight. Well, we appreciate your perspective. Thank you much, Steve. We'll check back in a little bit. We're going to go back now to Heidi Wigdahl. It was her camera that was sharing the shot of all the officers running in with the riot gear. What's happening over there, Heidi? Yeah, Julie, everyone is really pushing back now. We saw law enforcement move, move back, in. Move back We're moving back right now as well. Law enforcement, basically, they came from the south and pushed into the north. And now we're seeing them right here. You can see this line has just come around the apartments. So not only are they surrounding the area right around the Brooklyn Center PD, but now they've come out and taken another half block out here. So all of the protesters in this area are now moving back. We saw a large show of force with law enforcement moving to the north as well. So I assume there's more people 
to the north as well. We're seeing more law enforcement. Devin, if you go to the right over here on the other side of the apartment, there's a whole nother show of force of law enforcement on this side as well. So they've really kind of cornered in this entire space around these couple of four apartments right in front of the police department. We're now seeing as well buses move into the area right in front of the police station. Julie, uh, Randy? And obviously those buses are there to transport people that will end up being arrested uh, during tonight's unrest. Oh. Yeah, we are seeing, we're actually, Randy, we're seeing an arrest right now. Um, just right in front of us where this long line of law enforcement is, there is one person that we just saw tackled to the ground, or at least was on the ground and the law enforcement, op the officer um, is making an arrest right now. That's the only arrest we've seen out here in the past half hour though. But it sounds like people have moved pretty quickly from that area down Humboldt Avenue. Yeah, also, I, I can say all of the protesters that we we were kind of near, they have all cleared the scene now, and it, it's basically down to just this small group that you're seeing up here where people are capturing this arrest happening. And now we're seeing law enforcement move in on the right side over here. We're seeing law enforcement move in right now here as well. Yeah, we see it. We can see shadows of them as they start and, to move. Yeah, we're... Yep, we're seeing we're seeing more move in. We're going to back up a yep, little. Yeah, you guys probably need to move at this point. And this is something that uh, we are all too familiar with now here in the Twin Cities. This maneuver from police officers to try to separate the crowd, get them in smaller groups, and make their arrests or get them to go home.